Hello, I'm Jenny Orsop, Head of the Disability Service at University of the Arts London. And I'm Caris Kennedy, Senior Disability Advisor at University of the Arts London. We're going to talk to you for about 30 minutes about how taking a social model approach supports innovation and collaboration at our institution and enhances the disabled student experience. There's going to be about 20 slides in total. So first, to give you some context about UAL, we're Europe's largest specialist art and design institution. The mix of six art and design colleges across London came together uh, and were established formally as University of the Arts London in around 2004. We have 20,000 students in total and 16% of our students are disabled. That's about 3,200 students in total. UAL returns the highest number of students in receipt of disabled students allowances in England. When I joined UAL way back in 2010, it was struggling to meet disabled students' needs. Disclosure rates were around 12%. Disabled students were much less satisfied than non-disabled students. They achieved less well and they often dropped out. In 2013, we had the opportunity to set up a new cross-university disability service to coordinate advice and support for disabled students and equally important to deliver training and consultancy for colleagues to help them understand how best to meet disabled students' needs. Disabled students are now more satisfied their degree outcomes are much better and the institutional culture has changed from focusing on doing the bare minimum to comply with the Equality Act towards a best practice approach. And we've achieved this by putting the social model at the heart of what we do. So today we're going to share some examples of our approach that we hope you'll find useful to apply in your own contexts and we'll focus at the end in particular on how that, how that might be helpful in responding to the challenges associated with COVID-19. So first of all, what do we mean by our social model approach? So most of you will, I hope, have some awareness of the social model, but I think it's important to clarify how we understand it and how it underpins what we do. So students may have impairments, conditions, or specific learning differences they are only disabled if they have to operate in a study environment that has not been adjusted to meet their access needs. Barriers in the study environment could be physical, they can be procedural, or they can be attitudinal. Everyone who works within the university has control and influence over their bit of the university environment. They are responsible for making adjustments to it. And the adjustments that we make should, where possible, be anticipatory, not individual reactions to individual students' needs. Finally, all staff, and we include disability practitioners and support workers among them, need regular training about the social model to develop confidence and expertise in meeting students' needs. It's a discipline that needs to be maintained through regular reflection, commitment to action, review and further improvement. I'm going to share with you an example now from my own practice when I first realised the usefulness and power of taking a social model approach. It's 2010. I've just started working at the University of the Arts London. The university had been struggling to meet the needs of a blind student. The student was very dissatisfied and they were taking a year out whilst the university made the texts for their course accessible to them. There was tension between the course team, the library and the disability team about how to achieve this and time was running out. I'd been reading about the social model and had been researching providers of disability equality training around this time. I got agreement for key staff, including managers from each team to attend a disability equality training session together. I planned the session with an external facilitator 
and we agreed it would include a joint action planning section at the end of the session. The external facilitator helped each team to recognise what they should adjust within the bits of the environment that they controlled. So the course team um, recognised as a result of the training that what they controlled was the text and resources that the student needed to use. So they prioritised and revised reading lists, recommending more contemporary texts that were available electronically wherever possible. The libraries agreed to contact publishers to request e-copies of hard copy texts on the reading list. The disability service coordinated scanning services, provided a daisy reader to the student and recruited a study assistant to help the student access facilities in the library. The result was that the student returned and was satisfied with the arrangements that were put in place and went on to achieve a distinction in their course. It's important to stress that the part, the part, part of the success of this approach was down to using an external disability equality trainer. It's a really powerful and effective way to engage staff on an emotional as well as a rational level and persuade them to make changes to their environment. It's also really important to have clear agreements about who was responsible for making which particular adjustments. Following on from that piece of work, I collaborated with the Associate Director of Libraries who attended that training session over the following year. We looked at how the library could implement the action plan that we'd agreed at the disability equality training session and how we could improve the disabled student experience further. Together, we developed a, an assistant librarian post responsible for access and inclusion. That, that post is now permanent and the post holder works closely with the disability team. This approach has become the blueprint for how our team collaborates with other services to develop inclusive practices. So the formula that we use is to, wherever possible, provide disability equality training, including an action planning component, then support each partner service to deliver the agreed action plan. Work together to establish an in-house specialist within that partner team who is linked to the disability service and often supported by a disability service team member who takes a special interest in that area. And finally, we regularly review progress and provide refresher disability equality training at least every three years. We've established a range of other roles with other partner services, um, including an assistive technology coordinator um, and a single point of contact for access within our estates team. So embedding disability inclusion expertise within specific teams has enabled us to innovate and develop inclusive practices in a range of ways. So for example, within the libraries, um, they put accessibility at the heart of their strategy for acquiring new resources for students. They've our assistant librarian has trained library staff to help them use um, networked assistive software on open access computers. And um, disability, disabled students library access requirements are now fed automatically into the library system. So the moment that they've made contact with the disability service, they can access um, specific library access arrangements. Within the IT department, our assistive technology coordinator has helped us to acquire and network key assistive software packages that students can use, developed and procured online training resources to support staff and students in using those packages. We've trained staff um, on how to create accessible documents and how to help students use assistive software. And they have Test, they test regularly new software packages that the university procures and test the impact of upgrades prior to them being released on the network to ensure that they work well with staff and students who are using assistive software.
a single point of contact for access within our estates department ensures that um, changes to the fabric of buildings are um, coordinated swiftly and effectively in response to individual students' needs. They also coordinate um, the actions arising from the regular access audits that are commissioned um, across the university's estate and work, they work with us to prioritise what actions those audit, um, audits outcomes should be um, taken in. And they engage disabled, disability stakeholders, that's both staff and students, um, with the design of new buildings and the development of special projects to improve aspects of the estate. So I've used a similar approach in terms of providing disability equality training and action planning in order also to influence university decision making at the highest level. So use this approach to persuade universities executive board to endorse the creation of the cross university disability service back in 2013 and fund the substantial rolling program of disability equality training which now underpins how we work with other teams there was a key challenge in terms of influencing um, university decision makers which was to persuade them to attend training in the first place and make time for it. So the way that um, we approached that was to make the case for change, focusing um, on the benefits of inclusive practices um, and taking a social model approach, also focusing on and an analysing the risks that were associated with not meeting disabled students' needs. Um, so it was really important as well to draw on drivers from our own institutional context. Um, current drivers that might be relevant today, for example, would be, you know, does your university commit to um, improving outcomes for disabled students in its access and participation plan? What are disabled students um, telling you through the National Student Survey outcomes? And are there other drivers and levers that you could draw on, for example, um, are there general data protection regulation um, concerns and risks that would be mitigated by taking a social model approach? Um, are there risks associated with um, what we say to students about our offer in relation to consumer protection regulations too? So once I'd made the case and persuaded the executive board to take three hours out of their busy schedules to attend a disability equality training session, um, it was really important to, to provide a high quality session using a trusted facilitator. Um, we also included an action planning session um, and we documented the action plan so that um, they would feel accountable to it and could be held to account for it. And in terms of the actions for the executive, um, what they are really responsible for is um, resourcing effectively that was resourcing the service and um, the programme of training and also to mandate that training for all student facing staff. It's also very helpful to have a senior champion for disability issues so we have a member of the executive board who takes on that role um, and that can be really helpful um, in terms of having a senior figurehead to support or sponsor proposals particularly where we're asking for um, additional investment um, or for communicating with the university about specific disability initiatives and developments. The other really important thing to do is to hold the decision makers to account. Um, so over the years, I've provided regular updates to the executive board on progress, referring them back to the action plans that we had agreed um, and kind of updating them on the risks and the emerging new issues and how we might work to address them. So I can't pretend that we get it perfectly correct all of the time, but certainly that seems to have been the key to our success has been ensuring that they're well informed about a social model approach and that they understand that it helps them to mitigate risk and improve the student experience. We've worked really hard to embed the social model approach within the disability team's values and culture. This is really important because as disability practitioners, we need to lead the way to role model 
the thinking and behaviours that we're encouraging in others. Again, regular training is really important. And we have sort of advanced um, disability equality training every two years for the whole team, which we use as an opportunity to, to reflect on our practice, our processes and procedures, um, and identify further ways that we can improve what we do and further embed the social model in what we do. So we've used the training to examine aspects of our practice, including the language that we use, particularly the language around um, how we describe impairments and conditions, and how we articulate students' access requirements. We've reflected on how we have conversations with students, particularly how we pivot from perhaps necessary medical model style conversations about evidence and applying for funding, and how we pivot from that to a social model um, conversation focused on barriers in the environment. We also reflect on how we articulate those students' needs when we formalise them in an individual support agreement, which is the document that summarises their needs for course teams. We've also developed um, team values collectively, which are informed by the social model. And you'll see those on the banner of the slide deck that we're using as part of our branding, which are to respect individual students to provide support that empowers students to study as independently as possible and to promote inclusive practices to meet students' needs wherever possible. And we use these values to actively interrogate that practice in case-based practice sharing discussions and via line management discussions. And they give us all a really useful language to use um, that helps us to mutually challenge um, other people's practices or positions. Karis is now going to talk to you in more detail about how this translates into the work of the disability service. I skipped ahead by mistake. Um, so I'm going to talk um, for a moment about the disability advice side of our service delivery. Um, we have a team of eight disability advisors and two senior disability advisors, of which I'm one. Um, each full-time disability advisor has a caseload of around 600 students. These caseloads are allocated by programme rather than by impairment type. So, for example, I'm the lead disability advisor for Camberwell College of Arts illustration courses. So I work with any student on that programme, whatever their um, impairment or condition. Um, by working closely with specific programmes and courses, we learn more about the barriers that may exist on a given course. So, for example, the potential barriers on an illustration course are going to be quite different from those on a filmmaking or journalism course. So it allows us to build up relationships with um, specific programmes and the staff within those programmes to understand more about the course delivery, anticipate barriers and adapt our advice and recommendations accordingly. Um, another advantage of tech working with programmes rather than specific impairment groups is that many students do have multiple impairments. So this approach allows all students to have a single point of contact. It will be the same point of contact as their friend in the same class um, who might also be registered with our service. And it also allows to develop disability advisor expertise across impairment types. So we use a social model to ensure students' needs are met. Jenny's already spoken briefly about individual support agreements, which are documents that give practical information to course about things that they need to do or adjustments they need to make to remove barriers for disabled students. Our individual support agreements don't include impairment-specific information, so it doesn't say what a student's diagnosis is or frame anything in terms of what they find difficult. It focuses solely on practical, positive things that can be done to um, remove barriers for students. Individual support agreements also include information about the social model explicitly alongside information about the Equality Act. So we're foregrounding the social model of disability in these documents as we draft them with students and also as we share them with relevant members of staff. Another way we use social model to ensure students' needs are met 
are through a case conferencing approach where we work together with course teams and students to um, identify what the barriers are and seek to remove them. So a case conference approach where you've got, for example, a disability advisor, a course leader and a student together means that the disability advisor can model a social model conversation focusing on what the barriers are, what the student needs, what's worked for them in the past and what we might need to do differently without getting into detailed personal or medical information. So this um, shows to the student that a conversation can be had that meets their needs without the need to get into detail about personal information and hopefully empowers them that way. And it also hopefully empowers courses and academic staff to know that they don't need that information to have a quality conversation with the student. Um, another way that we use a social model to ensure students' needs are met are through our personal emergency evacuation plans. These were redeveloped quite substantially to focus on practical, not personal information. So it isn't the case that they talk in detail about what a person find, may find difficult as they're evacuating a building, but indeed what practical things are required to ensure that they can evacuate that building safely. I'd also like to talk a little bit more about um, our staff development offer. Jenny's already talked about this, um, how central our disability equality training is, um, and the social model is at the heart of that. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with disability equality training, uh, but by definition it's delivered by a disabled facilitator and focuses on the social model. We believe that the learning from this session applies to any impairment or context because it gives the tools and principles that can be applied in any setting to remove barriers for disabled students and disabled people. What we have done then is develop a suite of supplementary 90 minute workshops which focus on particular areas such as inclusive assessment. So for example, we talk about the relationship between the social model, the Equality Act and assessment to build on ideas um, explored in social model and um, in disability equality training in broad terms. One thing we did find um, is that even though we believe that disability equality training is relevant and applicable to, it, to all impairments, we were still receiving lots of requests for impairment specific training, people feeling that what they needed was autism awareness training or specific training about specific learning differences. So in order to respond to this um, request, these requests, while at the same time um, retaining a social model approach, we developed workshops which ostensibly focus on specific um, impairments, such as supporting autistic students through inclusive practices. However, the focus within those workshops remains on practical steps and inclusive practices which benefit all students. So although we talk a little bit about the um, impairment um, specifically, we quickly move on to a social model approach which um, can be more broadly applied. We know that good practice for, say, autistic students is good practice for all students. And we, we know this, so the workshops build on this notion using the social model as a tool to do so. Um, we've also got other workshops such as universal design for learning, making assessment briefings inclusive, and um, supporting student mental health through inclusive practices, but all of them foreground the social model and use it as a tool for their staff development. Um, so far this year we've um, trained over 360 colleagues and delivered 29 sessions and I'm pleased to say that we were able to keep those sessions running in spite of um, social distancing and COVID. Another way that we um, build the social model into our, um, into our work is through our publications. So we recently developed a disability inclusion toolkit, which is a series of 10 leaflets which provide practical guidance for supporting disabled students. And they all refer to the social model and they all include case studies to try and exemplify the benefits of the social model approach. So, for example, we've got publications on inclusive group work, planning academic visits, individual support agreements and guidance for inclusive teaching and learning, which talk about the barriers that students might encounter and practical steps to remove those barriers. We've also recently updated our website to include more explicit information about the social model. We found that students um, often aren't familiar with the social model, so we want to make our approach um, clear from the start. What we found is a bit of um, 
inverted commas, bilingualism is required, we still refer to specific impairments because they may be the search term students use or how they conceptualise how we work with. We also do need to refer um, to disability evidence that we, we require to register students with the service. But once students are registered with the service, we um, focus on the social model of approach and we talk through stu with students what that means. Um, in a moment, I'm going to show you a short animation which relates to that point. We're also um, very, very conscious that staff will want more information about all aspects of supporting disabled students. So we maintain up to date staff intranet pages, which include um, the Disability Inclusion Toolkit, information about training, but also information for staff about our approach, why we do what we do um, in the way that we do it, why we don't share um, diagnostic information, why confidentiality is so important. So we make sure staff have got access to that information as well. So we'd like to share a short animation that was um, published um, just in April, which we developed to introduce students to the social model. Um, the animation is on our website and there are links to um, audio described versions as well. And we're planning to use this animation to support our meetings with students, induction sessions, and just to give students um, at any stage of their student journey a flavour of how we work. UIL and the Disability Service use the social model of disability as a tool to support students. Here's what this means for you. Have you ever felt like the world isn't designed for you? Like you don't fit in? Each and every one of us is different, but it can feel like the world expects us to be the same. Every day I encounter barriers and things that disable me. Sometimes it's a building or an offhand comment that gets in my way. It can feel like my course is stored and assessed in a way that doesn't have me in mind. Sometimes I feel like I have to tell people my life story, just to get what I need. But it doesn't need to be that way. The social model of disability says that we are not disabled by our individual differences. We are disabled by barriers in the world around us. We are disabled by a world that doesn't take into account who we are and what we need. We don't need to change who we are. We can change the world around us. We can change buildings and courses and attitudes. In a university full of artists, designers and creatives, we can create a university that is designed with everyone in mind. A university that removes barriers for everyone, whoever we are. We can shape the world around us and the disability service can help. Thanks, Karis. So I'm just going to conclude by reflecting a little on our approach and particularly how it might help in the context of responding to COVID-19. So the biggest challenge that we'll face um, is a, probably a scarcity of resources. So the full impact of COVID on the sector is felt. So we need to work really hard to ensure that our institutions understand and recognise the specific risks and impacts for disabled people and make the case for protecting resource um, for specialist staff, um, for the training that is so vital, um, and to make the um, anticipatory adjustments that are needed to include students. Disabled students will expect more, not less, and the move to online learning has shown that um, there are certain anticipatory reasonable adjustments that um, some institutions may have fiercely resisted um, that actually are possible to put into place. So I have some optimism. Um, we've um, sometimes found it hard to get traction on um, mainstreaming inclusive teaching practices, for example. Um, but um, the uh, COVID and the, the rapid move to online learning is changing that. 
Um, there's been a radical change to teaching practices and the speed of that change seems to have removed um, some of the old sort of hierarchies um, in terms of decision making and also um, some of the old resistances um, as we've been forced to be flexible. So um, some of our recent successes and future developments include um, we worked and um, collaborated um, with a range of colleagues with an interest in teaching and learning and inclusion um, on developing um, inclusive online teaching guidance um, for UAL staff, which was published in April to support delivery over the summer term. And there's a link to that in the slide deck um, and it can be found on our um, teaching online pages on the UAL website. We're also um, collaborating with colleagues on developing a lecture capture policy um, for the institution and associated guidance for staff and students, which will be available um, in time for the new academic year. Um, and we are also doing more collaboration with teaching and learning colleagues now focusing on um, what, what do we mean, um, what would core practice look like in terms of achieving inclusive online, uh, inclusive blended learning and making sure that we don't forget the needs of disabled students um, when we are moving to um, splitting provision between um, online and on-site delivery. Um, we've also done some work, for example, with IT um, to renegotiate licenses for our networked assistive software um, so that students can access that software from their own devices outside of the university network during lockdown. Um, and we've also been working hard with our colleagues um, in estates and health and safety to ensure that the work that's done on easing lockdown and implementing social distancing on site um, is in, as inclusive as possible and the communication about that is also um, as inclusive as possible so that individual disabled students needs are met. That concludes um, our presentation today. Um, we hope that you found it helpful and informative. Um, if you want to find out more about what we do, um, please do um, visit our website um, or contact us using the details provided. We really hope that you enjoy the rest of the virtual conference. Bye bye.